Well, I have good news and I have bad news. Here's the good news. God loves you. Here's the bad news. God loves you. Today we continue our series on the first letter of John, a series that began a few weeks and will continue for the next two weeks. So today marks the halfway point in our journey. We have looked at chapters one and two, and in the coming weeks we'll look at chapters three and four. Today we are right smack in the middle of things with chapter three. And one of the principal things that we see in chapter three is an attempt to wrestle with the fact that the love of God comes to us both as good news and as bad news. On the one hand, the love of God is very good news indeed. We see this at the very beginning of the chapter. See what love the Father has given to us that we should even be called children of God. And then again at the end of the chapter, we hear that the love of God is such good news that we can even have boldness before God. We can ask God for anything and we will receive whatever we ask. All of that is very good news indeed. But on the other hand, when we hear the good news of the love of God, we learn some very unfortunate things about ourselves. We learn that we are guilty of lawlessness. We learn that when we see someone in need, our first response may not be to help, but to hoard. We learn that unlike God, we are not inclined to love, but rather to hate. Bad news. So the love of God introduces a certain tension into our lives. It is at once both good news and bad news. Good news because of what it tells us about God, but bad news because of what it tells us about ourselves. And the tension between these two is the basis of every other tension that we see mentioned in 1 John. Light and dark, truth and falsehood, life and death, Christ and antichrist, the world as God intends it and the world as we intend it. All of those distinctions follow from the more fundamental distinction that the author of 1 John makes between what the love of God tells us about God and what the love of God tells us about ourselves. Now, none of the tensions that we see in 1 John are things that we would have figured out or recognized for ourselves. Left to our own devices, we would have altogether failed to recognize the tension, or we would have done our best to explain away the tension. We needed God to show us there was a problem, and we needed God to show us the solution. And that, says 1 John, is where Jesus comes in. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose. The Son of God was revealed to destroy death. The Son of God was revealed to destroy falsehood. The Son of God was revealed to destroy darkness. The Son of God was revealed to show us there was a problem, and the Son of God was revealed to show us the solution. In fact, Jesus doesn't just point us to the solution or tell us about the solution. Jesus is himself the solution. And we first heard this a few weeks ago in the very first chapter of 1 John. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And now here in the third chapter, we hear it again, all who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. Those who abide in Jesus have passed from darkness to light, from death to life, and they abide in the love 
that the Father has for us. Now, none of that in 1 John is intended as abstract theological speculation. Everything that 1 John says about the love of God and what it tells us about ourselves has immediate practical consequences for those to whom this letter was written. A few weeks ago, Father Bob mentioned that it very much seems that 1 John was written to a community in trouble. There had been disagreements about how best to understand the faith, and those disagreements had gotten to the point at which the community itself had fractured. Some had left, some had stayed, there was probably confusion, hard feelings all around. This is why 1 John makes such a point of emphasizing the importance of mutual love. Verse 11, this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. In other words, this is of first importance. This is the basics. We should love one another. We should not pretend we have fellowship with God if we do not have fellowship with one another. We cannot call ourselves followers of Jesus if we do not do the very thing that God himself has commanded us to do. Everything that 1 John has to say is intended to address the concrete realities of a broken community. And this is not a new problem. The people of God had been wrestling with this problem for many years before the time of Jesus. This is why the commandment is both old and new. Last week when we were listening to chapter 2, we heard this, I am writing to you no new commandment but rather an old commandment that we have had from the beginning. And yet, this is a new commandment because now it is actually possible for us to follow the command to love. And here again, this is where Jesus comes in. Prior to the revealing of the Son of God, we had the command to love, but we couldn't follow it. We knew what to do. We just didn't do it. But now with the revealing of the Son of God, love is for the first time possible. The author of 1 John makes a very direct, very strong connection between the revealing of the Son of God and the commandment to love. <clears throat> Verse 23, this is God's commandment. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, love one another. These are not two commandments, these are one commandment. These two go together. Those who abide in love abide in Christ, and those who are in Christ are those who live in love. And the inverse of that is true as well. Those who do not do what is right, those who do not live in love, have not yet learned what it means to be born of God. Now we hear throughout 1 John an echo of something that Jesus himself says in the gospel according to John. Jesus says to his disciples, those who keep my commandments, the commandment to love, those who keep that commandment are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and we will come to them, and we will make our home with them. This word that you hear from me is not mine. This is from the Father who sent me. Now, we might very well wonder here, what is behind that connection? What does Jesus have to do with the commandment to love? Love one another. That seems pretty straightforward. <laughs> Why did it take the revealing of the Son of God to make it possible for us to follow that commandment? It takes the revealing of the Son of God to make it possible for us to live in love because, First John tells us, we don't actually know what love is. At least we didn't know until God showed us what love is through Jesus. We love only because God has loved us. Verse 16, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. That is the kind of love that holds broken communities, broken relationships together. We know love by this. He laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for one another. 
Now, the author of 1 John is not making this up. He's not the only New Testament writer to send a letter to a fractured community struggling to hold things together. Paul sounds a very similar note in his first letter to the Corinthians, a community that was likewise plagued by division and by discourse. Paul says this, love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious, love is not boastful or arrogant or rude, love does not insist on its own way. Love is not irritable, love is not resentful, Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Rather, love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. That is a prescription for reconciliation in a community that is divided. And like the author of 1 John, Paul draws a short, straight line between the exercise of love and the revealing of the Son of God. Paul says there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are a variety of services, but the same Lord. There are a variety of activities and ministries, but the same God. For just as the body is one and has many members, so it is with Christ. And you are the body of Christ. Now, left to our own devices, we find it hard to live in that kind of love. We find it hard to live in that kind of community. In fact, we find it impossible. (laughs) But see what love the Father has given to us. See what love has been revealed to us so that we might be called the children of God. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, that we might not only know what love is, but might be able to live in love. And when we live in love, then we too are revealed. We are revealed as the children of God. And all of that has an even larger purpose than restoring fractured communities and broken relationships. All of that looks forward to something even greater something beyond imagining. Verse 2, Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. But what we do know is this. When Christ is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope purify themselves just as he himself is pure. We are God's children now. And that in and of itself is extraordinary. Given our disagreements, given our divisions, given our lawlessness, given our selfishness, given our capacity for self-deception and hatred, who could imagine that we would be called children of God? But through Jesus, God has pulled it off. God has made us his children And that's not all. There is more to come. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. But we do know this. Whatever God has in mind, whatever God is doing in the world, whatever plans God has for creation, it's going to look like Jesus. Risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, and seated at the right hand of the Father. Our destiny, the destiny of the whole creation, is tied up with him. And when he is revealed, we will be like that. Again, the author of 1 John is just picking up on a theme that is echoed by other New Testament writers. Here's Paul again, this time from his second letter to those recalcitrant Corinthians. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what the human heart has even begun to conceive, That is what God has prepared for those who love him. Those are the things that God has revealed to us in Jesus. Christ was revealed for a purpose. And in Christ, we are revealed for a purpose. And one day in Christ, all things will be revealed for a purpose. And what that means is that those who live in love 
Those who abide in Christ share in the work that God himself is doing, helping to prepare this creation for an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all measure and beyond our imagining. The darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So let us walk in love, not in word or in speech, but in truth and in action and in Jesus. Let us abide in Christ so that he may abide in us, so that his life might be perfected in us. And let us live in the hope of that which has not yet been revealed, but that when it is revealed, we'll shine forth with the glory of the risen Lord to the honor of his name. Amen.